So Lenny Rebin, who was a professor um, at the University of Virginia, introduced us to clam oocytes. So the spigula clam, which is about the size of my, my hand here, has an ovary that's about the size of a <clears throat> one-year-old's fist. And you can, when, after you open the clam and you dissect out the ovary, um, which is pink, as opposed to the white of the males, <clears throat> you just dissect it up and all the oocytes, full-grown oocytes, fall right out. You don't need to do any enzymatic dis digestion. And you can get millions and millions of full-grown arrested oocytes from a single female, and he which is very unusual. In sea urchins, you probably get a, a maybe a couple of thousand, and frogs, you get a couple of hundred. So this was extraordinary material for doing studies on both fertilization, because you could take um, <clears throat> male from the sperm, and you could drip it into a pot of um, oocytes which were stirring, and you could get simultaneously uh, fertilization of maybe 300, 400 million oocytes, all within 10 to 20 seconds of each other, and then they would all begin to develop simultaneously. They would go through meiosis one, 30 minutes, meiosis two, at 60 minutes, first division at 90 minutes, and second division at 120 minutes. So I've, um, I was not interested in cell division at that point, but the large amounts of embryos that were available that went through an unusual division called um, an unequal cleavage. It's actually not all that unusual. A lot of mollusks and annelids do it. So they divide. There's one small cell called the AB and one large cell called the CD. And the, the fates of those cells and their progeny are already determined at that first cell division. So the little AB cells will go on to make um, skin and the nervous system and the larger CD cells will go on to make gut and the organs derived from the gut. So we thought that um, if you could get 400 million two-cell embryos and dissociate the cells and separate them, like on a, some sort of a sucrose or a phycol gradient, so the little cells would sediment at the top and the larger ones at the bottom, then you could maybe figure out what proteins or newly made proteins were segregated at that first cell division and then um, how that might program this, the resulting cell fates of those two different cell populations. So we worked on methods to figure out um, what kinds of proteins were segregating, and since that was a little bit difficult, we backtracked and looked at what kinds of proteins were being made by the two different cells, the AB and the CD cell. And we were having trouble getting the two kinds of cell populations cleanly separated. So as um, as just an aside, to, I suggested to my graduate student who was working on this that, well, let's just work out the method for labeling the proteins. Why don't we take the unfertilized oocytes and the activated oocytes and see what proteins that they're making and are there any differences? And so this was the experiment that kind of broke the field open for, the, for um, cell division from the, the, the clamocyte point of view. So we found out that within eight to 10 minutes, the oocytes stopped making one set of proteins and they started making a completely new and different set of proteins. And there were three proteins that were particularly strongly made and we called them imaginatively A, B, and C. <clears throat> and because my lab had the, um, the technology at that point um, to, to clone those, uh, the genes encoding, uh, the, the messenger RNAs en encoding those proteins, we set about to do that. Um, so we stopped working on a developmental problem, segregation of determinants of cell fate, and we switched over to translational control of these proteins. So what I didn't say is that the switch in protein synthesis was so fast that we knew it, it couldn't be transcriptional, that um, there was not enough time to make new messenger RNA, get it out of the nucleus and load it onto the polyribosomes. Instead, it had to be translational where you switch off one set of pre-existing messenger RNAs. The, the, the existing ones that are being used to program uh, protein synthesis in the oocyte are kicked off um, the polyribosomes, so they stop making those proteins, and the, there, must, there are stored messages, which we knew from previous work, that are loaded onto um, polysomes and start making new proteins. So this was a very dramatic, um, probably the most dramatic example of translational control of gene expression that's ever been seen so far. And it was entirely tractable to work with because you can get very large amounts of material, very synchronous, 
And so we started to ask, well, what's different about the messenger RNAs? And we quickly learned that um, the messages that were on the polysomes in the, in the oocyte that had poly A tails um, on their three prime end, and they became, uh, when they were kicked off the polyribosomes, they were deadenylated, no longer translationally active, and the stored messages in the oocyte that were not being used lacked a poly A tail, and as soon as fertilization happened, um, they gained a poly A tail, and that, that somehow caused them to load onto the polysomes and direct a synthesis of new proteins.